The art of good intelligence work is nothing to do with spying, Ned. The art is to manipulate the civil servants and ministers who operate the secret fund. The world follows money with a keener nose than it follows anything. If you can hide your bank accounts and your standing orders, if you can siphon and launder and divert streams of government money, then, and only then, can you truly call yourself a spy. All right, so there's no great mystery about the how, but in my case there is still the why. That is what makes no sense. When I first arrived, I thought I'd been kidnapped. But kidnappers don't keep shelling out money for their captives. So after a few years, I began to believe what Mallow told me, that I was a fantasist whose real life was buried so deep that no memory of it remained. I know that isn't true, and I suppose I always did. I know that I was taken here quite deliberately. But by whom? And why? That is what still eludes me. No one could have thought for a moment that I was an IRA collaborator, and if they had, they certainly would not bring me here to the same place they bring people like you. As you have seen, Ned, the genuinely insane come here too. You and I are the only inmates to flatter ourselves that we are political prisoners. You keep denying the possibility, but have you not stopped to think that perhaps those who put us in this place knew what they were doing? Perhaps I was admitted here because I truly am mad. Quite terribly mad. Yes, Ned admitted with a smile. Naturally, I've considered that. And, of course, you are mad. If, by a madman, we mean one who possesses a mind that questions and rejects every civilised norm, and whatever your condition on admittance, you have certainly become mad. The solipsistic hoarding of your own self and the hubristic munification of your will against the potent authority of the institution, these are textbook psychopathologies. Psychopathologies that privilege the artist, the revolutionary and the lover quite as much as the lunatic, however. You may acquit yourself of insanity on that account. Dear God, Thomas, acquit me too that I ever taught you to speak like that. I choose this style of discourse to provoke you, and well you know it. I return to the same problem again and again. I have somehow got on the wrong side of the British Secret Service, or whatever one chooses to call it. Can you not at least agree with me on that? Babe bowed his head in assent. You remember that time you sat under the Picea Abies and went through Zeno's paradox of the heap? I do. The idea being to encourage me to look at facts clearly, to separate the concrete from the abstract, the actual from the perceived. I don't believe I put it quite like that, but yes, I do remember. Well... Every night I go over what I am sure are the five salient points in my history and try to be sure that I've seen them clearly. They yield nothing. Tell me what you mean by the salient points. They're obvious. One, I unwittingly agreed to deliver a letter that was given me by an IRA courier. Two, I was arrested for the possession of drugs which had been planted on me. Three, because that letter was also still on my person, I was removed from a police station and taken to what I may assume was a British intelligence safe house where I was interrogated. Four, at the end of the interrogation I was told that I would be taken home. Five, I was not taken home. I was cruelly beaten and transported here where I have stayed ever since. I don't believe I'm wrong in identifying those as the important facts, surely. If you say so. What do you mean, if I say so? I've beaten my head against the wall of those facts for years and years. Which might suggest, said Babe gently, that they are of no use to you. Perhaps you have still not been approaching matters in the right way. The right way would not endlessly lead to an immovable wall of facts. It would disclose a pattern of events, a pattern that could be unlocked. By labelling your facts one, two, three, and so on, you are implying a causal, sequential relation between them that may obscure that pattern. But there is no pattern. That's what I'm saying. Don't ask yourself what happened to you. Ask yourself what happened to you. And what on earth is that supposed to mean? Did you have enemies, for example? You never talk about that possibility. I never had an enemy in the world, said Ned with some heat. I was the most popular boy in the school. I was about to be made captain of school. I was captain of the cricket team. I was in love. I was ready to go to Oxford. How could anybody hate me? Babe laughed. And what's so funny? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, let me try and explain. You have just summarised the situation of a person who might have good cause to be happy, but how does it answer my question? It is a description of someone for whom the classic response, don't you just hate him, was invented. 